Conversations Live, Get Your Garden On is made possible in part by the Environmental Programming Endowment at WPSU Penn State. Good evening and welcome to Conversations Live, Get Your Garden On. I'm Patty Satalia. Waking up the garden to a new growing season is about more than soil and seedlings. Spring is a pick-me-up for the home gardener as well. Tonight, Penn State Extension Specialists and a Master Gardener join us to share their tips for the best growing season ever. They'll also take your questions. Now let's meet them. Tom Butzler is a Penn State Extension horticulture educator. He works with commercial horticulture operations and the landscaping community in Clinton County. His area of expertise is vegetable production and beekeeping. John Esslinger is a county-based extension educator with Penn State Extension. <clears throat> he works with fruit and vegetable growers and in greenhouse uh, production. Justin Wheeler is a member of Penn State Extension's Master Gardener program. He's also a communication specialist for the Xerces Society, a nonprofit environmental organization that focuses on the conservation of invertebrates considered to be essential to biological diversity and ecosystem health. Thank you all so much for joining us. You, too, can join tonight's conversation. Our toll-free number is 1-800-543-8242, and our email address is connect at wpsu.org. You may also tweet your question or comment using the hashtag WPSUConversations. So, unfortunately, we've got this uh, holiday weekend ahead, and it looks like it's going to be wet. I don't know if that's going to dissuade people from getting out into the garden, but beginning with you, Tom Butzler, what are the do's and don'ts in terms of uh, garden? Gardening chores when it's wet. Uh, when it's wet, one of the things you do have to be concerned about is just the compaction of the soil. You know, going in there with equipment or even just foot traffic really can start compressing that soil. And you eliminate the air spaces, the water spaces, and it just inhibits root growth and you know a, a healthy plant. So you have to be careful with that. So avoid it, maybe. Probably until it dries out a little bit. But I guess I suppose one of the aspects of all this rain, or good things, all this rain, is that uh, in these cool evenings you do get a lot of uh, growth in the grass. So you may stay out of the garden, but once it dries just a little bit, that grow grass should be growing relatively quickly. And so you don't want that to get too long. Uh, you don't want to mow excessively because then you just get large chunks of grass that smother the, you know, the, the remaining grass. So you're going to get a lot of growth in the, in the lawns, in the yards. All right. Well, we're going to start with a little bit of show and tell until we get uh, our phones ringing. You brought a couple of things with you, Tom. I'll begin with uh, the Coosa dogwood. Right, right. Tell us a little bit about why you brought this particular thing and, and where yeah. you see it in the uh, landscape in central Pennsylvania. And so our... there are two types of dog. There are, there are several species of dogwoods out there in, in the landscape. Mo a lot of folks are familiar with our native dogwood, the uh, Corn Cornus uh, florida. Uh, this is not a native. This is Cornus cusa, uh, originates over in Asia, but it's uh, got a lot of ornamental characteristics. It blooms a little bit later than our native dogwoods, so those are done blooming. These are just starting to put out their, uh, their flowers, um, and they'll stay on for you know, several weeks. And um, Whereas our native dogwood, the flowers come out first, and then they're done, and then the leaves come out. Here with the cusa dogwood, the leaves come out first. They're nice, dark, shiny and they serve as a backdrop to these uh, white flowers. So it's a really attractive tree in the landscape. You see it being used uh, um, more and more. Uh, one of the other aspects of it is it does uh, produce some red fruit. So it's going to ornamental characteristic later in the fall. And then the uh, leaves turn a nice uh, fall color. So it's, a, it's what we call one of these, these multi-season interest plants instead of just a one-shot deal like Forsythia, where it just flowers and then it's just, just out there in the landscape, kind of a blob almost. So this has some uh, multiple and consider. one of the advantages of this is this is really is has a really high tolerance as far as the the uh, planting zone. It's good in pretty cold weather and also in pretty hot weather. Yeah, this one can move around. This one will do great in any of the uh, areas of Pennsylvania, whether you're up in Erie, which you know can get a little bit of cooler, or you know down in the uh, Philadelphia suburbs, or you know outside where you have in a different zone. So this is a very hardy plant. Yep. Okay, you know we're usually talking about there's an emphasis on on native plants, and and here you're kind of well, I, promoting I, one that's not. So. Sure, sure. I, I do have a lot of native plants in my landscape, but I think there are some plants in the, some uh, exceptions. In, in the in nursery industry that are just ornamental characteristics, uh, really sharp. And um, I'm not saying I want to go all totally native, but uh, I kind of like to mix it up. I don't want to go with something that has the invasive potential, and there are some out there. 
Um, so, you know, I, I care for what I put in uh, into the landscape, kind of research it like anything else. Okay. And so you also brought with you the Carolina allspice. Yeah, and I the, think what's interesting about that is, depending upon where you live, you might know of it at, by a different name. Yeah. Well, this, uh, there are some native ca uh, calicanthus. Uh, the uh, uh, genera is uh, calicanthus. There are a couple different species. Um, so, uh, you can go with the native one, or you can go with one that's been bred with, the, with one from over in Asia. But this is Carolina allspice. It has a, um, if you read the literature, it tells you it has a banana, pineapple, uh, strawberry scent to it. I must have bad, <laughs> a bad nose. I can't, I can't smell it in mine. <laughs> okay. But regardless, I mean, it has some nice ornamental characteristics. I mean, it's flowering right now. So, you know, in this cloudy weather and kind of a drab scene, you can go out in the landscape and there is something really attractive to, to, to look at. So in fact, they're so perfect, they look fake, we, sitting this close to it. Yeah, right. Well, you know, when you look at it, it you know, it, it is, it's got that nice dark red, kind of a maroon color, and really stands out with these dark, shiny uh, green leaves. So, you know, it's something to, to look at if you want to get away from some of the bread and butter type plants we talk about. You know, it's just, you want to get away from Coosa dogwood which is being used more and more in the landscape. Maybe go with something a little different. Be and, different in the neighborhood. <laughs> and yeah. you want something colorful. But I think another one of the advantages of this particular plant is that it's uh, tolerant of sun and full shade. Well, I wouldn't go all the way to full shade. I, it, a par, I would go partial shade. Once you start getting into full shade, uh, plants start to get a little straggly. Uh, and you're not going to get uh, as uh, profuse flowering. Um, so it will live, but I don't think it's going to give you those ornamental characteristics that... Uh, that you see in the catalogs that would really make you like, oh, I want to go out in the landscape and look at that. Okay. All right. We're going to move on to John Esslinger, who brought along uh, something that lots of us are going to be looking at in the next couple of weeks, and that is uh, greenhouse plants. So what, what do we look for? What is the sign of a healthy plant for transplanting? Okay. Uh, Patty, th these, I brought these along because I, I went to a local greenhouse and picked these out because these, these are really what we're looking for. They're a nice stocky plant. If you look at them closely, you see they've got a nice thick stem a lot of carbohydrates in that stem so that when you transplant them you'll be able to uh, you know, they'll run off of those carbohydrates and, and do really well. Um, what you're going to look for is, is a plant that's got good color. Uh, you want to watch the lower leaves, make sure they're not turning yellow. But the other thing is the maturity. You don't want an old plant. Sometimes people think, well I want a plant that's already flowering or even has fruit on it. Well if it's flowering and has fruit and it's been grown in a small like root cell like this, that plant is beyond the maturity that it should be. And so when you put that in the garden, it's not going to produce. So it's basically stunted because of what it's growing it is. in. Yeah. And, and will it ever catch up? It'll, it'll never be it'll as... It'll produce fruit, but it's never going to produce the fruit that it should have if it was planted younger. And so if you're going to you know, get them not exactly perfect, get them a little bit on the young side and let them catch up versus being in the cell too long. Uh, the other thing is, is you might buy them thinking, well, I'm going to plant them this weekend, and then we get rained out, and it may be a week or so before you plant them. When you've got a plant that's a little bit younger, it'll, it'll do fine in that cell for a week until you get out in the garden. And, and how planted. soon should that be put in your either container or in your garden? Um, <laughs> depends on the weather. Um, but typically, I, I would prefer that you just go ahead and buy them and try to get them planted quickly. I mean, they're going to do, they're going to be healthier in the greenhouse than they are going to be with you have them at home trying to take care of them. Okay. And how so. about, uh, you brought another plant, eggplant. Yeah, the, egg, the eggplant, the same, same way. And just, just kind of emphasizing, just try to get a, a younger plant. Um, that picture you're showing, those plants are kind of flopping over a little bit. But those are nice, young, healthy plants that you put those in the garden and they're going to take right off. All right, we go to Justin. Uh, the Master Gardeners just had their 27th, uh, 20, 2017 plant sale, and there were more than 36 variety of uh, pollinator plants. Tell us a little bit about those. Sure. Well, um, I think a lot of times when people think about pollinator plants, they're looking for flowers that are going to be ornamental, attractive, maybe bloom for you know, a long period of time. Uh, one thing that they may not take into account is um, butterfly host plants. So adding an extra dimension to their pollinator garden. Um, if you don't provide host plants, you'll have butterflies that um, pass through the landscape, but they aren't going to live in your landscape and produce caterpillars and be there for you to enjoy for the long haul. So what we're looking at here is the Labrador violet. What makes it such a, a good plant for people interested in attracting pollinators? Yeah, so you say violet and most people freak out because they're worried about them invading their lawn and reseeding and being really weedy kind of plants. 
Um, but violets are actually uh, host plants for all fritillary butterflies. Uh, we have uh, somewhere around six uh, fritillaries that are native to this area. So if you plant violets, you're pretty much guaranteed to get uh, fritillaries. Uh, the reason I like Labrador violet is because it has these uh, really attractive dark purple leaves, uh, very small, very compact. And unlike uh, you know, Canada violet and some of the more common violets, it doesn't really uh, spread and reseed out into the landscape. So it'll create these tidy little mounds and it's actually a, a nice uh, ornamental ground cover. All right, and this next picture of, is of the Eastern Black Swallowtail. Could you describe the plant and why it's uh, one of the winners as far as you're concerned? Yeah, this is kind of like the gateway drug of uh, gardening <laughs> for butterflies because it's one of the easiest. It's a, it's a very common butterfly and it's one of the easiest to attract to your landscape. Uh, it hosts on a wide variety of uh, plants in the carrot family. So that's everything from Queen Anne's lace to uh, dill, fennel, parsley. Um, on the left there you have um, bronze fennel. Uh, and on the right we have our, our golden Alexander, which is our native plant in the carrot family. So um, the very first plant I ever brought home and put in my pollinator garden was bronze fennel. And within two days, I had a caterpillar on it. So it's, it's proof of concept. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're going to come back to some of that, but I'm going to take a couple of phone calls. We've got uh, Louise from Altoona on the line. Go ahead, please, Louise. Hi. My question is regarding poison ivy. Uh, it seems to be taking over uh, my, my planting areas. And I've asked the landscaper if he could help me get rid of it and he he isn't willing to do that he says the oil get on his tools and and then his crew continues to be infected with poison ivy is that true and what should i do a good question Tom? well it, correct and she mentioned the word or term oils i mean it it it, 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 it can be a, when you look at it the leaves are shiny and there is oil on that and once that's transferred to uh, skin you get that skin irritation um so really <clears throat> i i guess the best thing to do is just someone be able to uh, wear some protective equipment, whether it's gloves or whatever, and go in and, 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 and pull the, uh, um, the material out of that landscape. Of course, there are uh, some herbicides that you could use to, to apply to, to kill that plant. No one has to touch it, so that's always an option. But just be aware that it is a perennial and so uh, even if you pull it and you leave some plant parts behind, it's it, going to grow back. It's going to grow back and you're going to be in the same situation. So, you know, either the use of herbicides or find someone uh, that can pull the material. Um, I think if you if you wear the pers the proper protective equipment, um, I, there's and then throw word. it out and throw it out. There there should be uh, you know not, very little skin contact there. So. You know, one of the things I read because this is a problem in my landscape was to actually cut the stem and then paint the herbicide on that area, and it sucks it up. If you do this. Uh, in the height of the season on a really hot day and they're responding because they're thirsty. It's thirsty, so you've got this systemic right. uh, reaction and you more prone to actually kill the po poison ivy. There are a couple of different ways you could apply the herbicide. You could apply it to the leaves, but you talked about what they call a, a stump or a, a basal right. treatment, and that, that is just as effective, too. I, actually, probably more effective than just applying it to the leaves. Okay. So there are multiple ways that you can uh, you know, approach that problem. And, and what time of year? So she's seeing it now, I'm guessing. Um, should you attack it now, John? It's most effective like in August and September. In August and September. Okay, yeah. so live with it now. Yeah. Just stay away from it. And, and be careful because sometimes the herbicides, like if you're going to use something like 2,4-D, that's a broadleaf, a lot of the ornamentals we have are broadleafs, and so you, you've got to be very careful. Okay, I, and, I, and I've read Weed Be Gone and Finale. Are these things that, you're familiar that with? That has 2,4-D in it. Yeah. Okay. And, and so, yeah, if you spray that on, on other broad leaves, it'll take them out also. All right. It's not anything, very selective. All right. Anything yeah. to add, Justin? Yeah, well, I've, I've just the best advice I've heard is um, if you can, uh, you know, wear your, pr your protective equipment, um, wear gloves that are maybe disposable. But, um, you know, what I've, I'm one of those lucky people who's immune to it. <laughs> so maybe I should uh, come over and do <laughs> some pulling. Um, but Louise, what I, he'll be over. What I've heard is you put um, some plastic, you know, t two plastic bags, plastic shopping bags over your gloves and go out there and pull, pull, pull while it's young. Um, you know, if it's in an area like a vegetable garden where you're going to come into contact with it, of course you want to eradicate it as much as possible. Um, if it's out in your woods, it is a native vine and, you know, you can leave it be and it produces berries for birds. So, um, oh, I didn't realize yeah, that. Yeah, as long as it's uh, not in an area that's going to come, you're going to come into contact with it, you can kind of ignore it. All right. Okay, we go to uh, Dick from Johnstown. Go ahead, please, Dick. Well, thank you. Uh, last summer, um, I planted uh, seedlings 
from seed rather zucchini. It gets about five hours a day. I had great growth, uh, uh, many blossoms, but very little fruit. And I was wondering if it's a pollination problem. Uh, I'm going to plant them in the same area again this year. Or if you could think of perhaps uh, another reason why they didn't uh, uh, bear fruit. Thank you. John? It, it, it could be pollination, but it also could be, and I've done this myself, is if you over fertilize them, they're not going to set fruit. They'll grow a beautiful plant, but uh, they just won't set fruit. And, and did Dick say he fertilized them? Well, he, he said he got a lot of nice growth. Oh, okay. Yeah, but um, yeah, typically, sometimes those first flowers aren't going to set fruit, but then from that point on, the, the native pollinators should be doing and, and zucchini definitely does require the pollinators. Not does. everything does. Um, uh, maybe some tips, Justin, on, on attracting the, the appropriate pollinators to the garden? Yeah, well, it, it does sound like it might be a, a fertilization uh, issue producing a lot of flowers but little fruit. Um, if you do a lot of uh, tilling in the, the area around the zucchini, the pollinators are going to pollinate uh, that crop as well as uh, pumpkins and some other plants uh, are ground nesting, so you want to disturb the soil as little as possible. Um, but companion planting with things like borage or some annuals to bring in more pollinators close to the uh, plants might, might do the trick. Anything to add, Tom, to get no, this? That, no, that, okay. those two yeah. things right there. I mean, if you add too much nitrogen, you're promoting vegetative growth at the, at the expense of reproductive growth, and that's what John uh, was stating there. All right. Hope that helps, Dick. Thank you so much for your phone call. Uh, we go to an email. This one comes from Patricia, who writes, <clears throat> for vegetable gardening here in central Pennsylvania, when is the last date for planting vegetable seeds, such as corn, beans, squash, in time for the plants to produce ripe vegetables before frost? With the weather we have, in <laughs> anyone's these past guess? Yeah, it's almost anyone's guess. I mean, some of these seasons we can go really late in, in, into planting. Now, you know, corn's going to kind of have a cut a cut off date, but for some of these smaller crops, I mean, you can plant for several more weeks. And if you have to throw over a protective structure, if we run into a little bit of a cold spell later in the season, get by that, and you still have several weeks after that. So, you know, corn might be an issue, but some of the squashes and, yeah. and beans, you can go. Uh, several yeah. more weeks. And there are some corns that take forever to produce right. ripe fruit yeah. and others that are relatively quick. Yes. Usually about June 20th, you should, probably should cut off the, the corn. Okay. Snap beans, squash, they're, they're quicker <coughs> maturing and so you can plant those a little bit later. All right. Uh, we go to Phyllis who's calling us from St. Mary's. Go ahead please, Phyllis. Yes. I have some old, old tanny plants. And I would like to know when is the right time to transplant and separate those, and when is uh, how do I get rid of the rust that seems to be appearing in late August and just dis destroying the plant and getting them getting them all dusty. Tan? What kind of plants? We didn't. I don't think we heard. I, I didn't hear. Peony. Peony. -E oh, peony. Okay, I'm sorry. All right, peonies. Yeah, I'm, I'm not real, I don't grow a lot of pe peonies in my landscape. My mom did, but it being a perennial, probably the best time uh, to do that is, you know, in, late in the season. Right now, everything's setting up that vegetative growth. If you split now, uh, you might do some damage, but in the fall, it'll be a great time to, to divide your perennials. You know, it's a great way of, you know, expanding your garden, so fall would be a good time. As for rust, yeah, I'm not sure, I'm not familiar with I, rust. I'm, on I'm thinking maybe she's seeing powdery mildew. Okay, okay. Yeah. Justin, you're shaking your head. Yeah, yeah, I'm. I'm. I confess, I'm not a huge fan of peonies for that reason because they're very susceptible to powdery uh, mildew. So really, the best thing you can do for them is keep them well thinned, uh, provide good air circulation, uh, make sure they're planted uh, where they're getting enough sun. Um, and in terms of dividing, because we've had such a long cold season, you might get away with it now. But I tend to agree, you want to wait until fall, wait until they're done blooming, and and then you can divide them. All right. Good, to, uh, good luck to you, Phyllis. Uh, Abby from Confluence, you're on the air. What's your question, please? Um, I have a wisteria plant that I've had for years, and it does a lot of growing, but it's never um, produced any flowers. Hmm. Justin? <laughs> that's, um, <laughs> that's pretty common with wisteria. I'm, I'm imagining that you probably have uh, an Asian variety, uh, not uh, an American wisteria. Is that correct? Do you happen to know what, what variety you might have? No, I've had it for a number of years. It, it throws like lots and lots and lots of vines, but 
yeah. never any flowers. That's that's fairly common. Now they can take really aggressive pruning, so I would say um, you know you can you can cut it back uh, to reduce some of that growth, and that might encourage uh, flowering. Um, I'm not advocating for this, but I've heard of people going to extreme measures and whacking the vine with uh, a chain to, to bruise it and stress it <laughs> to cause flowering if you're desperate. Um, but, uh, but yeah, wisteria can be tricky. It can take a number of years and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it'll bloom and then it might not do it again for several more years, so. Any, anything to add? John or Tom? Uh, I, I'm, I've never really heard the chain thing, but if, if, <laughs> I mean, if, it, if it, it makes you sleep better at night to go whack your tree a little bit, go, go ahead. That's, okay. Give it a go. All right. Well, good luck to you, Abby. We go to uh, Janice, mm. who sends us an email. She asks, the borer has killed all the ash trees in my 10-acre woodlot. Does the borer attack other tree species? Tom Butzler. And that's a really good question, Janice, and that's a, a, a good lead into one of the tr uh, uh, plants I brought. Okay. So uh, the she's referring to the emerald ash borer, and um, it has done a pretty good job on our, our native ash population here in Pennsylvania. So you can see where uh, the woodpeckers have come in and kind of uh, remove some of the bark to get to the uh, the borers and, and, and eat that. But uh, this is a um, a, uh, a fringe tree. It's a native. Uh, to, uh, this area. Actually, it's more native a little further south, but it, it's a plant that is, does very well in Pennsylvania. And uh, there have been reports that the uh, emerald ash borer is, uh, um, uh, can go after the, uh, our native fringe tree. It's a relative of ash. It's in the same family. So other than that, those are the only two reported species of plants that this emerald ash borer um, has been detected on or, or feeding on. But and what do you do if you see them? What can you do about them? Well, uh, uh, on an ash tree or, I mean, really the only thing you could do or is the white fringe tree. On the fringe tree, I guess if it's a, it's a specimen plant, um, a uh, insecticide treatment might be warranted. Uh, you know, there was some recommendations for the ash, uh, for your ash trees in the landscape. If it was a highly valued tree that, you know, you, you do some uh, sort of protection. But other than that, in the forest setting, there's very little that you can do. I mean, there is a lot of research going on looking at some, some biological controls, some, some predators and things like that. But I just wanted to mention this uh, fringe tree because um, it is in flower right now. And it's really a neat looking it's, uh, flower. It, it's very attractive. It looks like it's dripping. Um, uh, uh, these blossoms, very fragrant. Now, they're not open for very long, several days. You get a, a good windstorm halfway through flower and it knocks the rest of them off. But um, uh, very attractive, and then it has very nice fall color. So you know, it's one of, again one of these multi, one of these multi-season interest plants. It's just not like the forsythia, which is flowers and it's done. Uh, it does fruit a little bit. Kind of looks like a, a large blueberry, a little bit elongated, kind of hidden a little bit. And uh, it is attractive to, to birds. We're talking about some, you know birds and poison ivy. So they are attracted to this. So it's a nice landscape plant, and it's native. And it's native. All right. So yep. you should be able to find that at your uh, fairly easily at your. Uh, it's not some. It's not what I call the bread and butter landscape nursery. plants. Uh, you might have to go to a nursery that uh, carries a little more of the unique, more uh, exotic. Yeah, kind of like. And so you know, just shop around. But uh, it gets about 20, 25 feet in height. So it's a large shrub or a, a small tree. Okay, very good. Uh, we go to Bridget, who is calling us from Altoona. What's your question, please, Bridget? Um, I have two questions. One is I wanted to improve the air quality inside my house. And I was wondering if there are any particular plants that are recommended to increase the oxygen level. And the second one is vinegar. I've had vinegar um, be recommended to kill weeds. Is, is, is that a viable option? I'll take the second one. <laughs> the vinegar? <laughs> okay. Um, the acetic acid, which is, is vinegar, uh, can be used for some weed control. I mean, we don't recommend using vinegar just because it doesn't have a, a, a label to it, but there are specific products that contain acetic acid, and it is effective. Just be aware that uh, if you got something like poison ivy, it will burn the leaves, but since poison ivy is a perennial, it's just going to put up uh, new growth. So it works real well on, on annuals. 
But okay. as for house plants... And the first plants, part, house plants that, uh, that help improve the oxygen in the house. All, all plants are going to help with the oxygen. I, I can't tell you which ones are better. Than, do, do you know, Justin? Yeah, well, I know that um, several plants, like a spider plant, for example, um, it, uh, it, it all uh, plants that you bring indoors are going to improve air quality, but there are specific plants that can do things like uh, sequester formaldehyde and benzene and things that off-gas from um, Your carpeting, from furniture for example, and carpeting. Right? So I, I have a lot of spider plants in my house <laughs> because I know that they're particularly good at sequestering uh, benzene and formaldehyde. And uh, as far as the vinegar thing, this is actually something that we've been researching a lot because we get a lot of questions about it. And, and you're, you're quite right. You can't go out and just buy uh, white distilled vinegar from the grocery store because that's only about 5% acetic acid. So it's just not powerful enough. No, and uh, so you need a minimum of 20%, which is something you generally have to special order. Um, and it's only going to kill, it's, it's not a systemic. So it's going to be great at killing grass and annual weeds, but it's, it's not going to be equivalent to Roundup. Okay, very good. Thank you for that call. We go to Barbara, who's calling us from State College. Go ahead, please, Barbara. Yes, we just bought a hybrid butterfly magnolia tree, and on the top uh, leaves uh, that are sort of limp and brown already. I was wondering what's causing that or what we can do to rectify that. Tom? Yeah, <clears throat> so you, 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 uh, Barbara, you just bought this from a, from a nursery? Yes. And was it in a container or was it ball and burlap? Ball and burlap. Okay, so if it was ball and burlap, uh, and I, I don't know, do you know when this plant was dug and, and placed? Uh, it, you mean when it was dug and sent to the nursery? Yes. No, I don't. Okay, well, you know, with the ball and burlap, well, with a container when they're grown, when it's grown in plastic, most of those roots are self-contained in that container. So there's very real, little root loss when that plant is moving from nursery, from site to site, and right. so forth. But a ball up burlap plant, the majority of the roots are, are left in the ground. They uh, get cut off it, when, when they remove it from the exactly. nursery. So there's a little bit of a transplant shock, a little bit of stress to those plants. And I just wonder if, if you're just seeing a little bit of stress. You know, uh, a week or two ago, we had some temperatures that were like 90. We had th th three days of 90. Here. 90, and it was windy. So even yep. if you had some cloud cover, that wind going over those leaves, you know, they're sucking out that, that moisture out of those leaves. And if there's not that root system to replenish the moisture in the leaves, those leaves will dry out. So I, I just wonder if maybe you've got some, you know, transplant stress shock uh, issues there. Is there something he can do to, to sustain it and, and get it through? Well, at this point, probably just some TLC. Make sure that it's watered, uh, um, a mulch, so that if we do get those drying winds, that soil doesn't dry out. There's plenty of moisture there for, for some of those remaining roots there uh, to access. So uh, those are about the two things right now. Uh, but that brings me to this question. Ordinarily, this would be a good time of year to transplant trees. Mm -hmm. So kind of, kind of a difficult situation, you know, that the, that the weather has been so extreme, 90 degrees, and then the next day, 50 degrees. We, and windy, we, as you said. We planted, for, for Mother's Day, we planted a dogwood, and uh, we got that terrible, you know, hot, dry yeah. weather. And we, we just kept a, a sprayer by the tree with water, and just every couple of hours sprayed it down, you know, maybe two or three times a day. And that, that did help some get it through that. But once those roots get established, you don't need to do that anymore. But and how long does that take? A couple of weeks? Yeah, I'd say give it a couple of weeks. You and, know. and we hope that he uh, dug a big enough hole to make it easier, easy for those roots to, uh, to spread. Yeah, and, and what Tom said as far as keeping the soil moist is gonna be a big key. Okay. Just make sure you don't go the other way. I mean, people sometimes drown their plants. You know, they just think, well, I need to go out and water twice a day for, yeah. for four weeks. Well, you know, you can drown those plants just as easily as dry them out. So Good, good yeah. to know. And with that sprayer, we're just spraying the foliage. So just kind of keeping a mist on the foliage. Oh, okay. If you are just joining us, I'm Patty Satalia, and this is Conversations Live. Get your garden on on WPSU. Our guests tonight are Penn State Extension educators Tom Butzler and John Esslinger and Master Gardener Justin Wheeler. Our telephone number is 1-800-543-8242, and our panel is ready to take your phone calls. If you'd prefer to email us, our address is connect at WPSU.org. I go to uh, Elsie now, who's calling us from Dicer. What's your question, please, Elsie? Hi, I put tomato plants in last year, and I got those big, ugly, green, um, 
look like caterpillars with horns on them. Oh, yeah. And they just, like, chewed through my plants, like, in a day or two. Leaves and tomatoes. I got those, too. Justin, yeah. Yeah. I haven't uh, seen them since I was a kid. Uh, What are they? Uh, yeah, it's tobacco hornworm, and it actually evolves into a really beautiful moth, which is little consolation if they've eaten <laughs> all of your tomato plants. So I'm very sorry to hear that. Um, the one time I got it, I was lucky enough to have it um, attacked by a predatory wasp that actually, a little gross, but it lays eggs on the caterpillar, and that ends up doing the caterpillar in. Um, in terms of you know dealing with it, one of the, the best things you can do is just pick the, the caterpillar off the plant and toss it in your yard somewhere and hope that either a bird or one of these predatory wasps find it. All right, you brought those in as show and tell once. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, the predatory <laughs> wasp that had yep, infected yeah, the white, it up. Yep, yep, little white <laughs> structures on it. Yeah, they can defoliate a tomato plant uh, uh, pretty quickly. quickly. Yeah. yeah. And so, but they and they can be hard to find. And they're hard to see. Well, yeah, because the they're color. a little camo- cam- uh, camouflage. Yeah. Yep. Right. So. Yeah. All right. Well, good luck. We hope you don't get them this year. Uh, we go to Stacy from Three Springs. What's your question, please? Yeah, I was wondering if there's any perennial uh, flowers or shrubs that I can grow under a walnut tree or out to at least the drip line on a walnut tree. Good question. We actually got an email about a, a walnut tree that we might get to later um, because a walnut tree puts out some toxins, right, mm-hmm. that, that makes it difficult for things to grow uh, nearby. Yeah, want... it... I, I John? Oh, it, it's, a, <laughs> yeah. it's an extensive list on plant material that is affected by uh, the secretion out of, out of the roots Walnut. and you know, composting of leaves and so forth. So off the top of my head, I don't know what is, uh, what can grow underneath. Um, they're readily available online. Uh, you know, Penn State has a fact sheet. Most of the land grant universities have fact sheets on what is affected and, and alternatives and placing in those. I do know that in the gardens, tomato plants are a really good indicator plant. Um, and, you know, if you're in close proximity, it kind of tells you how far you have. Because to your tomato plant won't do well. It will just it will die. Will. Right. Well, okay. So what, what's the perimeter? She she mentioned. Uh, do you know oh. what the perimeter is? Where the safe zone? Well, the hard thing is the the chemical that's that's toxic is juglans, and it's in all parts of the plant, including the leaves. So even the the uh, leaves that fall from the tree all over your yard and the walnuts um, contain it. So it's a pretty wide margin. It, it extends beyond just where the the drip line of the tree is. Um, but there's there's actually a surprising number of things that will grow. Um, uh, you know, I always, I guess I'm a native plant nerd. That's always the first thing I think of. But there's a lot of native plants that are resistant to that juglans. Um, there's a flowering raspberry, which is uh, not the edible raspberry, but it's an ornamental. Um, it does quite well under walnuts. Um, uh, golden ragwort, which is a ground cover, um, and, and several other ground covers will grow. But if you... Uh, um, you know, as these guys said, if you uh, Google it, there's great lists out there for what is resistant to it. All right. Good luck to you. Uh, Marlene from Crawford County, you're on the air. Good evening. Thank you for this program and am enjoying it immensely. Thank you. Um, back back to the Coosa dogwood. Uh, my dogwood has a very circular gray mold growing on it. Is this harmful? It's a fuzzy kind of a mold. It also affects my sour cherry tree. Uh, what can I do about it? Tom? I, I think what she's talking about, and I don't have a picture, but just going on the general description, I think she's talking about lichen. And lichen is uh, just two organisms living together. It's an algae body and a fungal body. So when you think of, of fungi, I mean, the mushroom belong to that group. And the one color that mushrooms don't have is green, so they can't produce their own food. So it's partnered up with this algae body. It's a symbiotic al- relationship. Exactly. It's a symbiotic relationship. And if anything, any consolation, we talked about consolation on some of these things <laughs> you encounter in the landscape, it is an indicator of good air quality. Um, so I mean, you can take that home there. But um, it's not killing the tree. It's not extracting nutrients from the tree. It's not a parasite. So you'll typically see these lichen growing on plants that may not growing quickly. Um, they're under some sort of stress or it's a really damp, shady environment. So if you go up on a rid- ridge line going hiking in the woods, you'll see a lot of those trees on the ridge that are buffeted by, you know, winds and so forth. You'll see a, a lot of lichen because those trees are kind of stunted and not growing to their uh, potential. So I just wonder if maybe that uh, Coosa dog would maybe being stressed out a little bit and just not growing 
but the lichen is not her problem, and she doesn't no, need to worry lichen, about getting rid of it. Right, lichen is there's there's not a problem with lichen, and she mentioned her other tree uh, having that on it, and so I just wonder maybe you know maybe some mulching, maybe it just gets stressed out during the growing season, and maybe some mulch just so that you know, it's just and, and not drying what, out. Or, what kind of mulch would you recommend for a tree, and and how deep? I think that's important. The depth of, of mulch is important. Right. Well, the depth is important because roots are close to the surface and they do breathe. And so, you know, you put on several inches of mulch. I mean, you can you can do some damage. Not that the tree is going to die out right, but it, it does stress them out. And I guess the other thing is, you know, what what do you want to use as mulch and what do you have at hand? I mean, there are there are you can use ground up leaves. You can use, uh, you know, compost. You, I mean, you can use um, some people, they don't like to add mulch every year. They use rocks. I don't, aesthetically, I don't like and it. It's certainly not adding any nutrients. No, it's not. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's whatever is available right. and aesthetically what is ever pleasing to your eyes. What would you like in your landscape? So I think maybe drive around or, or you know, just look at some alternatives. There's a lot. All right. Just, Anything to add, Justin? Well, I would just uh, say that you want to look for a quality hardwood mulch if you're going to use a wood mulch, just because that way you're going to be sure that it's, uh, you know, clear of weed seeds and things like that. If you're using a colored mulch or a dyed mulch that you might buy at the store, it's probably chipped up wood waste uh, that you don't want to be introducing to your landscape. Uh, so because just, why? What might it introduce? Often, um, if you have a red bark or a black bark that's been artificially dyed, a lot of time that that's uh, chipped up pallets and wood waste um, that comes from China, comes from other places, and they just dye it and sell it to you in a bag. And uh, those things are often treated with chemicals that um, uh, inhibit the wood from decomposing naturally. Um, and you just don't really want to be adding those things to your landscape. Oh, good to know. All right. Uh, we go to uh, David from Belfont. What's your question, please, David? Uh, yes, I have a question about common milkweed. Um, I've been encouraging milkweed to grow in my yard, and the patch has been spreading. But uh, last year, and it's coming up now, but last year it seems like when the monarchs were coming around, that my patch of milkweed was already sort of fading. So can I cut this back and sort of postpone the growth uh, to to have a you know nice fresh milkweed for the for the butterflies when they come in later in the year Justin um, unfortunately that's not a plant that's going to respond well to that course of action um, I think what you experienced last year is we had kind of an epic drought um, very dry hot summer so I think the plants probably just petered out um, you know, the monarch butterfly uh, migration is really affected by weather. So if they have, you know, terrible weather during the breeding season in the south, they may not get here on time. So it's, it's very dodgy. Um, what I like to do is uh, rather than just pr uh, plant one milkweed, I plant several varieties. So in addition to common milkweed, um, I'll plant swamp milkweed, which is also native to this area, and it's a little more garden friendly. Um, it doesn't spread the way that common milkweed does. It has a, a fibrous root system, so it kind of stays in place. And despite its name of swamp milkweed, it's actually tolerant of a lot of different um, uh, soil types and conditions. Um, but if you were to plant that and have common milkweed and maybe even uh, orange butterfly weed, which is another, um, chances are one of those is going to sail through these different conditions and, and be there when the monarchs need it. And of course, for the monarch, the milkweed is essential. But if you want to attract other butterflies, you had another uh, another couple of uh, flowers on your list, the Baptist, uh, Baptisia. Am I yeah, pronouncing that yeah, correctly? Yeah, it's, um, so it's false indigo is the common name, but it's one of those that's almost easier to refer to by the uh, botanical name, which is Baptisia. Um, and that's a, a really phenomenal plant. It's, um, it looks like a shrub, uh, but it's, it's not a woody plant. Uh, it comes up uh, this time of year. It's in flower right now. Uh, it's very dense and mounding. Um, it's a host plant for something like uh, eight different butterflies and several moths. Um, but what I like about it is it's a phenomenal plant for uh, bumblebees. So whenever it's in bloom this time of year, bumblebees have to, to stick their head deep into the flower. And so when you walk by, you get a lot of bumblebee butts in the air. So if that's your thing, it's kind of well, interesting. Well, speaking of bumblebees, <laughs> bumblebees are actually really efficient uh, pollinators. And, and I think it's interesting to note that just recently, uh, the rusty patch bumblebee was added to the endangered species list. That's correct. Yeah, it's the first bumblebee to be uh, 
listed as an endangered species. It's the first bee in the continental United States to be listed as endangered. And this is a bee that was once very common in our area. Uh, up until uh, 1999, it was st spotted in our region, and since 2000, um, it's pretty much disappeared from the landscape. Uh, it's in isolated patches in the Great Lakes area and a little further east. Um, but it was uh, just listed, so it'll be the first bee to get uh, protection under the Endangered Species Act. And commercial uh, bees are part of its problem, right? Part of the threat to this uh, rusty patch bumblebee. Yeah, it's really interesting and something that a lot of people probably don't think of, but um, they actually rear bumblebees commercially in greenhouse operations for tomatoes and other crops. And they and move them from place to place. They do, and also those uh, bumblebees escape uh, through ventilation and through cracks in the greenhouse, through windows. Um, and they actually carried disease out into the landscape and infected our uh, other bumblebee species. All right, so real quickly, what, what can we do um, to support bumblebees? I know this is a, an area of extreme interest for you as well. Well, I, I think you kind of mentioned it's just a wide diversity of plantings out there. Um, you know, for the uh, homeowner, the idea of just planting one species of, of a plant just because the flowers look nice, it, it looks nice to the eye, but for the things that are flying around and visiting, collecting nectar and collecting pollen, they need you know things that are going to be blooming throughout the length of the From season. From spring through fall. Exactly. So you, you have to have this plethora of foraging material, and you need to uh, plant not just one plant, but in, in swaths. Um, and and um, so I think it will look attractive and, and accomplish some other things too. Okay. I want to go to you, John. Uh, you brought some other show and tell. Um, and, and that is uh, apple trees right now have little fruit, and uh, there's some things that, that uh, homeowners ought to be doing about them, thinning. Tell, tell us what they should be looking for and what they should do. Yeah, well, what, what we recommend on an apple tree is to have about one fruit every eight inches. And a lot of times we'll just say, you know, try to keep it about that far apart. The apple tree itself is interested in making seeds. And so you see from the picture, that's one cluster and about every four to six inches on the tree, there's a cluster just like that. Um, so by thinning those off down to one fruit, then what that does is it allows the fruit to get larger. It also allows for that fruit to have better flavor because the sugars are be concentrated more in that fruit. The other thing it does is it allows that fruit to fruit every year, for that tree to fruit every year. Um, if you don't thin them off, then what you'll have is a big crop one year of, of mediocre quality, and then the next year you won't have any fruit at all. Okay, so that cluster we were just looking at, how would you know which ones to pluck off? Well, look, look close, and, and uh, I think I did have a picture of some insect damaged fruit, but we have several insects that, that attack fruit. They're, those are primarily the plum curculio damaged fruit. Um, and so when you're deciding, okay, which fruit do I keep, you know, look at them close, any of those that have any of those kind of dimples, uh, that's going to be there until harvest. And so uh, try to, you know, pick those to pull off and, and leave the ones that, that have, uh, that are free of defects. And do it now so that you're not allowing this, the, the energy to go into a piece of fruit that isn't going to become anything. For, for stone fruit like peaches, right now is the perfect time to do it. With apples, um, and if we can go back to that picture of, of the, the cluster again, with apples, um, we're gonna have what we call June drop, and that usually happens early in June. And what the tree does is in the center there, the one with a little bit shorter stem, that's the king bloom. And the tree's gonna keep that apple above all the others. But you can see those smaller ones, the tree probably knows that it can't handle all those apples, so it's going to abort those couple of apples off there. So, Probably in about two weeks, you'll see that that cluster, instead of there being six apples there, it'll be down to three or four. But that's still too many. We really should just have one apple. So you can save yourself a little bit of time by waiting maybe 10 days from now to go out and start doing your thinning. So cut it or pull it? Either one is fine. Just be careful because it's easy when you're breaking those off to break off the leaves that are there with it. And those leaves are very important because they're the ones that actually feed that apple. And so, you know, a lot of times I'll take little pruners and just go out and just, just so I don't pull the leaves off. Okay, sounds good, good tip. We go to uh, Melody who has been patiently waiting to get on the air. She's calling from Johnstown. What's your question please, Melody? Good evening, have a nice wet evening for you all. <laughs> hey, my question is, we've got that very evasive Mount Minute vine. How can we eliminate that? What kind of vine? Say that again for us, please, it's Melody. Called a mile a minute. Mile a minute. Oh yes. yes. It's a vine that yes. grows right around the trees. It's got jaggers on it, small leaves. 
uh, almost like a maple type of a, a leaf on it, but it's a, like small. Sure. But it is just, everybody knows about it, but nobody seems to be doing it. It's from J Japan, I guess. It's another one of those brought into the country by mistake. Uh oh, sorry. Right. Well, let, let's see. What can we do, John? How do you get rid of those mile a minute vines? Uh, and that, that's that's one that uh, produces a lot of seed. So you're you're, you know, and you know, just just physically taking the time to remove it. Um, you know, herbicides work on it, but that that's not it's not hard to kill. But the problem is, is often you'll find it in, you know, plants that you need to protect, and so it's it's a lot like the the poison ivy we talked about earlier, and it's it's an investment in time. Yeah, those thorns are pretty, they're kind of recurved, and so they, it can be kind of difficult to work around. They, they'll, they'll stick, they'll get you in the skin and so forth. But it is an annual, mile a minute is an annual weed. So it's, uh, you know, it contrasts that to poison ivy where you know, it's a perennial, okay. it's got that underground structure and it can, you know, re regrow. If somehow you can pull it and, and, and manage that seed, um, you know, I don't know how long those seeds will last or viable in the ground. That may be viable for two or three years. You know, they don't, they'd all don't want to germinate at once. But, it, you know, you can approach it as, a, as an annual and, and don't have to worry about it as, as a perennial like poison ivy. Do we know anything, Justin, about how that particular mile a minute vine got to the U.S.? Ah, I don't exactly. I mean, there's so many um, things that were brought over intentionally as ornamentals and unintentionally with, you know, on other plants. Um, but yeah, that's that's a real a real baddie. I, I want to take this phone call from Frank, and then I want to talk about something that I'm seeing around my landscape, <clears> and I think <throat> other people in Central Pennsylvania is uh, are, and that's uh, the poison hemlock. So uh, keep that in mind. And I'm going to go to Frank from Hillsdale. Frank, what's your question, please? Uh, you gentlemen realize triple superphosphate and fo superphosphate is no longer available to us in bulk. Can't buy a 50-pound bag to save your life. Also, the fertilizer people are trying to sell just a minimum number of things. We don't want a lot of chloride in gardens, but they're pushing 0060 potassium chloride instead of 0050 potassium sulfate. What do we do? Why would they do that, John? Uh, you can still find potassium sulfate. Uh, you know, I, often it, it works well for a lot of the growers I work with, and they're able to find it. It's just the potassium chloride is is more common and it's less expensive um, you know and again you know, the, the chlorine will dissipate um, but that that's the more common product um, and basically I think it's probably more of an economic thing than anything as far as why the potassium chloride is more available but Frank sounding like he doesn't want that in his garden right you can purchase you, you can actually you know, if you can't find it locally you can go online and, and purchase it also Okay. Anything to add, Tom? No. Uh, no. Okay. Uh, I, I said I was going to talk about this poisonous hemlock, and we have some pictures of it. Um, it you mentioned earlier, Justin, uh, Queen Anne's lace, and that's sort of a look-alike. But we're talking about a really poisonous plant that, along the slab cabin run um, and in different areas in center region, uh, it's growing everywhere. What well, can you tell us about it, Tom? Well, I just want to point out one thing that you, when we talked about the mile a minute weed, he, sure. and he talked about the ornamental characteristics, and that's how a lot of our invasives uh, come to be here in the United States is that at one point someone, someone thought, liked it. Yeah, someone <laughs> liked it. And so you mentioned poison hemlock, right. and that's a perfect example of someone looked at that, and it has an attractive flower to it, and so it was brought over for ornamental purposes, and then it just kind of ran amok here um, in, in certain areas. It's, it likes the kind of the wet environment, so that's why we see it along the creek. Okay, and, and any information about, uh, you know, how to get rid of poison yeah, hemlock? I mean, there's because a lot it of... is highly, highly toxic to uh, farm animals and to people in very, very small doses. R right, so it has some, uh, some properties to it that you know, most folks and animals are somewhat allergic to, so you get a, a reaction to it. Um, but, you know, it's a nice contrast between the poison ivy, which is a perennial, we talked about mile a minute, which is an annual. This is a biannual. So it's only going to live for two years. So, you know, one of the things you could do <clears throat> is, uh, is, is cut it down, uh, chop it off at the ground. And, and it, it won't have the energy for next well, year. It, well, it depends on what, oh. what year it, your, of growth it's in. Okay. But after two years, it's, it is done. So if you can prevent it from going to seed and then, um, you know, remove that foliage so it just can't, you know, do its thing, after two years, it, it is done. It can't propagate itself. So that is one way to, to control that. Whereas we talked about poison ivy, you know, if you cut it, it's going to send up regrowth. 
and so um, of course there are herbicide options to mm. that too. But. Okay, very interesting. Uh, Jeff from State College, you're on the air. Hi, Patty. It's Jeff Hughes. How are you? Hi, <laughs> good. But how are you? <laughs> I'm great. Hey, I, I did have a question about geraniums, but I will hold that for another time. But I just <laughs> wanted to call tonight on this very special occasion. I, I know that you don't want to make a big deal of it, but many of your viewers probably don't know that you're about to retire from WPSU oh. after nearly 30 years of service to our station and the communities we serve. So I didn't want to let tonight pass without uh, calling in to thank you for all the truly exceptional work that you've done for WPSU over the years. I've told you many times, and I, I truly believe this, there's simply no better host or interviewer anywhere in the business. You're, you're truly <laughs> exceptional, and we'll never be able to replace you. So, so on behalf of the station and your many viewers and listeners who I know feel the same way, we want to wish you the most fulfilling and enjoyable retirement. And I know you have more questions in the phone queue, so... Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that, but uh, we hope you'll join us for ice cream and cake after the show. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You are tricky, Jeff Hughes. Thank you very much. Really, really appreciate that. Uh, how do I go to a question after well, that? Well, congratulations. <laughs> well, yeah. thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and on that note, we're going to go to Eileen from State College. What's your question, please, Eileen? Oh, well, thank you for taking my call. Uh, my question is, why are there so many homeowners and landscapers that are mounding mulch up the tree trunks like a foot almost two foot sometimes i see and uh what can we do about that they're trying to slowly we kill call, their trees we, we call them mulch volcanoes <laughs> yep. why I think it comes down, we've used that term aesthetics a couple times. But it I, is just aesthetically pleasing. When I see well, it, I feel like so. they're suffocating that, your tree. I, I think so. We probably do. But for some folks, they like that look, I guess. I don't know. I'm, I don't know where that started. I'm a lot more cynical, and I think it's because landscapers get paid to apply product, and they get paid to apply mulch. And so, hey, if a little mulch is good, a lot of mulch is great. And it, it drives me crazy. Um, I want to run out in the middle of the night to all these shopping centers and clear away the mulch and you know, bag it up and resell it. That's what I do on the <laughs> side. But it's, um, yeah, it's really damaging for the trees. Yeah. I mean, it stresses them out. It uh, causes root rot. It, it just introduces all kinds of problems. And basically, if you hate trees and want to shorten their lifespan, go ahead. But it's, put, put it's this volcano of mulch around Not it. the way to do it. Oh, okay. Well, hopefully we've informed a few people, educated a few people about that right here. Um, we go to, thanks for that call, Eileen. And we go now to Joan from Crescent. What's your question, please, Joan? Good evening. Um, I was wondering, I have some ground ivy that's like literally taking over down through a gully on our farm. And I was wondering, is there anything that can be, um, we've tried pulling it out and stuff, but it's like overwhelming us. And I was wondering if there's anything that ivy doesn't like that I could use. Hmm. John? Uh, I'm sorry, what do you mean by used to like a, a herbicide or you think about planting something else there um i just really want to get rid of the ivy and it's so there's so much of it it's too too much to like keep trying to pull out because it's um so heavy rooted that no matter when you do pull it out you right. leave even a little piece it just takes right back off like as though you didn't do anything is there anything like um that i could use that uh, would either kill it or deteriorate it to the, where it won't like the acidity in the soil or something? Um, yeah, no, I, I wouldn't try that approach only because you want to grow something in that spot in the future. Um, you could try using something to cover it, to, to, you know, you could either use a herbicide, something like Roundup, or, you know, just something like a plastic cover, black plastic, something that's going to smother it out um, and, and, you know, kind of control it that way. Um, but yeah, that, that's not something you're just going to pull out and, and eradicate. Uh, how about goats? <laughs> fence, fence in the area and, and put in some goats. I like that idea. Yeah, I, I can't imme immediately think of any plants that would outcompete it. Even my favorite plants for that sort of thing wouldn't and, go toe to toe with and, it. And pulling it out really sounds like a only alternative. It would be a nice hobby to have for many years. I mean, you could <laughs> you could do it, and eventually, over time, you might weaken the root system, but it's probably always going to come back. Okay, so I think solarizing it is probably if you if you want a chemical free option is going to be the, the best bet. Okay. We're going to quickly go to an email. This one comes from Carl who writes, 
I speak for all gardeners at the Tudic Park Community Garden. We have a terrible problem with Mexican bean beetles each year. Once the first crop of beans is complete, they take over. Removing eggs and nymphs rarely works for long. I'm reluctant to spray once the bean pods are out. Uh, Justin. Uh, that's, that's not one that I'm terribly familiar with, actually, and I, I don't know if maybe the solution might be to not plant beans for a year and maybe not provide their, their host plant, but... Tom? No. Well, uh, John works a lot with, with the snap bean growers, so that's, I mean, you see a lot that's their main crop is, is on beans. It's a, like a lady beetle look-alike. It, it is, and, and for a commercial grower, uh, there's other insects like corn borers, things yeah. like that that get in, so they're, they're applying an insecticide and they're controlling them that way. Um, yeah, unfortunately, though, that e even like the organic insecticides are, are relatively toxic, and they're they're very toxic to pollinators. And so, mm. you know that that's something. So so a nice a easy there, okay. yeah. Uh, and I'm not. I mean, I, I like spinosa because it is a very safe insecticide. You know, relatively speaking. Um, but I don't know that spinosa is real good on that particular insect. Okay, uh, in, in just a couple of words, if you could get homeowners, gardeners to do one thing this season, what is it? Uh, I guess the way I started off was with all these plants, I think explore, okay. go out and look at new things. All right, John. Okay, and this might sound counterproductive, but keep your vegetable garden small. It's much better to have a smaller area, take good care of it, get good crops versus being really ambitious in the spring and then not following through the rest of the summer. Okay, when you say small, 14 small by... Small enough that you can go out and keep those weeds out. Don't think about planting it. Think about how much time do I want to spend weeding it. Good advice. How about you, Justin? Uh, well, my go-to would always be just plant something for pollinators. So uh, even if it's uh, pots on your patio or, or a small area of your yard, uh, annual sunflowers, if that's all you can do, great. If you want to take on a more ambitious project and put in a pollinator garden, uh, great, but uh, every little bit counts. All right, thank you all so much for being with us tonight. Our guests tonight have been Extension Educators Tom Butzler and John Esslinger and Master Gardener Justin Wheeler. I'm Patty Satalia. For all of us here at WPSU, thanks for joining us. Have a good night.